Good evening, good night, good day, everything. Bonjour, salut, buenos dias, everyone around the world. And if you're in a country I forgot the major language, I'm sorry. You can send it to me by text, Twitter, and I'll get it to you next time. <laughs> so good evening, good night, everyone, again. And tonight we have a special podcast. I know we were off last week, but that's because we brought you a special episode with Richard Ng this week. We have a guest, but before I get to our lovely guest this evening, let me get to my co-hostess with the mostest. I am nothing without these ladies. First, we have Andrine Soli Tennis Travel. Hello. And the Cato Kale of Podcasts, our foreign <laughs> correspondent, sometimes known as Lavern, but she is known to you throughout the airways as Janina. Hello. And Reels, but... I'm not important here, as always. So <laughs> no, tonight. you are. You are. <laughs> I just said that for the compliment. Thank you, Andre. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> but tonight we have today we have a special guest with us. As you know, all our guests are always special, but today we have to the lovely effort of Andre and Soli Tennis Travel. She brought with us today a guest by the name of Kamal Murray. Am I saying it correctly? That's correct, Kamal all Murray. Good. Yes, so he's here, and if you're on YouTube, you can see that he's lighter. I'm not making up that voice. This is not <laughs> real. It's one of his tricks. This is a live and room person. Kamal Mari is here with us from his lovely home, I believe, somewhere in Illinois, if I'm not mistaken. Chicago. Chicago, oh, Chicago. yes. Chi Town. Yes. yes, so. <laughs> That's a real a welcome here. I have a board meeting there next weekend, actually, so that'll oh, be fun. Oh, Janina. Yeah. Andrine is traveling again, Janina. <laughs> I know. We're, we're we failing here. Let the man introduce yeah, yeah. himself. Anyway, okay. let's not get involved with, you know, uh, Andrine Shady, even how she's traveling so often. Well, Kamal, can you tell us a bit about yourself? Let our real tennis podcast fans know who you are and what you're about. And you can tell, us, tell them why you're not, like, a random person on our podcast. So I'm, um, I, I am a random person. I'm just uh, <laughs> a, a kid from the south side of Chicago that grew up playing tennis, started playing tennis at the age of seven, uh, went to college on a scholarship, worked in corporate America for about 10 years and decided that, um, you know, wanted to try to recreate a type of tennis environment that was responsible for my success as a kid um, and opened up the doors for more kids uh, who look like me. Hmm. When you say look like you, do you mean, what do you mean exactly? I mean, African-American, you know, kids or, you know, even just kids who come from modest resources. Um, you know, tennis is, can be highly restrictive, um, you know, because of the, the cost and the access and location of clubs and where all the events are. Um, and so, you know, my goal was just to try to address as many of those areas as possible, obviously creating affordable tennis lessons, affordable groups, uh, putting a program in proximity to people from you know, a very diverse population, um, but at the same time making it high caliber with people who have tons of choices would choose to come to our program. How okay. did you get involved in tennis? You said you started playing at the age of seven. Yeah, so my mom was, um, my, my parents took 20 young men to Africa in July when I was uh, seven years old. And we came back at the end of July, and uh, all the summer camps were full. So we were driving down 87th and Jeffrey, Jesse Owens Park, and there were some kids out there playing tennis. And so my mom pulled over and inquired uh, as to whether or not they would accept one more student for the remainder of the summer. And um, the guy told him, Told her it would be twelve dollars for the rest of the summer, and so she kicked me out of the car and drove off. <laughs> <laughs> I would have too. <laughs> she sold you for twelve dollars. For twelve dollars. <laughs> she said, I, "I can't even find a babysitter for that amount of money, so you got to play tennis." And look at you now. That was probably the best twelve dollars she ever spent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that is. That is twelve dollars has recreated itself into um, thirty scholarship recipients, thirty you know, tennis scholarship recipients, you know, two thousand kids served in the Chicago public school system and more to come. So oh, oh. that's amazing. Great twelve dollar investment. <laughs> so tell us about um tell us about the initiative that you started. 
Access Academy. Tell us about um, that. So the facility where I learned to play at was the High Park Racquetball Club. Uh, and at the time, it was a, I mean, a great place. It was affordable. Tons of kids playing. Um, every day from 3 to 5, there was a free program that the Chicago Public School sponsored. Um, and that's how I started. I walked there every day after school. And, um, you know, when I was two years, out of, two years out of grad school, I was living in New York City. And we came home over Christmas vacation and uh, got this bright idea to take over the old facility. Um, ah. So it had been it had been abandoned at some point. So it wasn't abandoned. It was just being operated by somebody else. Okay. Uh, and uh, you know there was there was so much more opportunity to be exploited, for lack of a better term, on the south side, uh, and so much more talent that could have been tapped into. And so I just decided to, you know, be the one to do it. Oh. And you did. So yeah. how is it? How is the academy organized? What's the structure of it? How do how do you find the kids? Who are the kids? How do yeah, they? Yeah. So I mean, we're the only indoor tennis facility on the south side of Chicago. So we get a ton of kids that just come to us because of our location or just, you know, just being the sole facility indoors in the city or on the south side. Mm -hmm. uh, but then we also go into schools and we find good athletes. We find kids who really want to uh, do it. Kids who have not been, you know, brainwashed by. The NBA, I believe they're going to be the next Derrick Rose or <laughs> Kevin Garnett or whoever it is, right? Uh, and we try to. Can you say that again, please? Can you say that again, please? Because, you know, I work with kids, you know, and the, you know, I, you know I, I struggle. I struggle to tell them, let's do the maths, kid. Let's do the math. Only 10 people on a basketball team, okay? Only five playing at a time. How many you think is gonna get? How many you gonna get in Chicago Bowl? How many of you gonna get there? Right. They're only picking ten people, so relax, kid. Yeah, so um, you know, kids come to us. I mean, kids come to us. We have a ton of kids that come from the suburbs, downtown, Lincoln Park, uh, South Side, West Side. Um, you know, who just are looking for an affordable program. So we're one of the few affordable programs in the city. So we get a lot of kids. That but you also up. don't, you don't turn anyone away, right? No, I mean, we have a scholarship model, so, um, you know, individuals can submit their W-2s and tax returns, um, and then we offer anywhere from 15% off to 100% off. Ooh, you're on, checking uh, receipts for real. Oh, uh, yeah, we, we check the receipts <laughs> in the dollar sheet, right? Um, oh, wow. Yeah, I was but, thinking, I was just going to go up and say, I, don't I look poor? Can I join you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I gotta bring paperwork too. Yeah, so we we verify income and employment and all that kind of stuff, and uh, you know we try to find a way for everyone who walks through the doors to be able to access the program. At at so, one time, how many how many kids are you serving at one at one point at one time? So we're doing about three hundred at our physical location now, and we're doing about two thousand inside the CPS gymnasiums. CPS oh, so. in Chicago Public Schools. Chicago Public Schools, yeah. And those students who are, I guess, those who are taking it seriously from CPS are funneled back to your program. Yeah, I mean, in addition to the kids that just find us on their own, we have a goal of trying to get 10% of the kids that we touch in the schools to try to come into our facility to, you know, play tennis on a real tennis court with real tennis balls um, and join, you know, programs with kids from different neighborhoods, you know, to get the full experience. You know, you're, gonna, you're only going to get so good in a gymnasium, right? So the gymnasium program is, is great for us to introduce the kids, but um, in order to really get the full benefit of it, you need to be on a real tennis court, um, you know, in a real environment with kids from different socioeconomic backgrounds, different levels, et cetera. So uh, the goal is to try to get 10% to convert from the schools in addition to the kids that already just find their way into our building. Cool. I have a question. So you say you're the only indoor tennis facility in Chicago? No, only indoor on the, tennis facility on the on south, south side. side of Chicago, yeah. Okay, because I'm about to say Chicago is like a really, really, really Yeah, no, on the north side. I know why it's supposed to be outside. Anyway, people shouldn't even be outside just to go get groceries, okay? Yeah. Groceries are supposed to go on the ground. But, okay, just check it. Yeah, no, <laughs> so are, the, ma are the majority of your students um, minorities then? Yeah, the majority are minority, yeah. For sure. So we're about 72% um, minority. 
Do you get a pushback from the beginning that black kids don't play tennis? Because that's what I see in my area here in Ohio, in my own family even. When I signed my son up for tennis lessons, my own husband said, what? Black kids don't play tennis? Um, I, don't, I don't get that from black people. Um, I mean, I think that's out there that we don't, you know, it's probably not our, our first choice, right? You know, obviously we're looking at baseball and football and even track all, and field too. Yeah, track and field, all the things that we can access without an official program, an expensive tennis racket, an expensive private coach. Um, but I do think that the, the minority tennis is in my area strong. I mean, there are still people playing tennis who were around when I was a kid. I mean, guys used to give me a ride home. Uh, and they're all currently still playing in our club, in our men's leagues. So I agree when you compare it to, um, you know, the masses. Yeah, we're definitely underrepresented. Um, but for people to say that black people don't play tennis, I mean, if you look at, you know, the top four Americans today are all African American. Amen. You know, Venus, mm-hmm. Serena, Sloan, and Madison. So some of us are playing, right? And so we just got to <laughs> try to find a way to get more playing. So I want to, before we kind of move on from the academy, I just want to say, how do you, if I'm a kid that goes to the academy, sort of take me through the best possible scenario for the program for you. Um, you know, so we recommend that each kid get a minimum of four hours a week on group uh, mm-hmm. and at least one private lesson. Um, okay. And so the group start as low as twelve dollars an hour, right? So those are here. Well, the magic hour. number, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you know, um, the groups are affordable, and then we, you know, once the kid has a genuine interest in the sport, and the parents seem committed, then we recommend investing in private lessons. Uh, okay. And if you can't access those, we have mechanisms in place to try to help you access those. Or even if it's start with a semi-private, where it's, you know it's a two-person. Uh, private lesson. So um, that is that is sort of our formula where we try to get mm-hmm. the kids at a young age on the court a minimum of five hours. And as they get older, we try to escalate uh, that up to anywhere between eight to 12 hours a week on the court. Okay. Um, and it may seem like a lot, but it's not when you eliminate the video games out of their life, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, Don't even get me started on that, please. please. Yeah, so <laughs> so that's that scenario. So we pair, you know, we did come up with a development plan. We look at the height, weight of the mother and the father to try to project uh, how big the kid is going to be, you know, what kind okay. of natural Ooh. skills wow. the kid brings to the table. Um, and then we pair them up with, you know, if they're left-handed, we have four left-handed coaches, right? And so okay. um, we try to pair them up with someone that they gel. And then we try to find a coach that gets passionate about the kid. So we've got 17 pros in our, uh, in our academy here and, you know, it's all about fit, right? I mean, certain people can, you know, teach a kid a private lesson, but you really want to have a coach that's going to um, emotionally invest in the kid, right? And and everybody's not the right fit. I mean, there are kids that come to my program that I um, that I like, right? That I just can't just work well with them. Yeah, yeah, they, yeah just work <laughs> well. And so we um, we try to find a coach that's going to take that um, investment in the kid, and then. As long as the coach takes an investment in the kid, then they're willing to do what's right for the kid. So they, even if that, that, that means bringing in help okay. right, or asking for another coach. And so that's sort of our process. Um, and then we try to educate the parent on tournaments and points and rankings and, you know, how this crazy monster spins out of control by the time you get 14 and you end up, you know, traveling all across the country and missing school and taking off work and missing Christmas and missing East, and missing. <laughs> Oh, you know, okay. New Year's to compete. Uh, exactly. And why Christmas there in Australia? <laughs> <Nah>. <laughs> exactly. That's New Year's Eve in Australia. This year, away from my wife and kids. So, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's crazy. Well, you're still at home. I'm, 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 anybody around came, there, though, They didn't there. change the locks. When I got back, the locks oh, were okay. Well, that's oh. good. <laughs> She took you back. So then, yeah. obviously, they go through this program, and the hope is that they get college scholarships to play tennis. Absolutely. I mean, um, you know, girls get eight scholarships per team, right? And they're mm-hmm. just there's every year there are scholarships that are unawarded, just because there aren't enough people playing at that level. And so one of the hooks for us is that uh, we've been able to successfully send a majority of our kids to college with scholarships. Mm-hmm. So we have 
real life examples of kids who went to the same schools that these kids go to who are playing on college teams such as U of I or Northern Illinois or Stony Brook or Duke and all these other schools. So um, we don't have to do a ton of convincing because, mm -hmm. you know, these kids are in our building. They're working our summer camps, you know, in their summer break from college. They're home during Christmas break. And so the parents can look at that kid and say, okay, there's a kid that successfully has gone through the program and is getting a free education. And so that's the goal. And as long as all the parents um, commit to the system, right, mm -hmm. stay consistent, uh, stay committed, and trust the coaching, then the majority <laughs> of the kids will end up where they should be. Yeah. So I was reading up on yourself, and, I'm, and I have to say one of the things that struck me is how pragmatic you are that a lot of times coaches may scout young talent and be like, oh, your daughter or son would be to the star, would be the next this or next grade or whatever. But you have kept it rather pragmatic and be like, look, college is a great place. We all can't be on the pro circuit because you tried the pro circuit. You, you mentioned, I read that you try satellites and you coached in with something that you've always wanted to do. I thought that you were passion strongly right there. And you're like, you can get to college, get a free education, and who knows what else would happen beyond that. But right. shoot for somewhere attainable that you know we all can sort of get to. And I think that's really helpful, particularly when it comes to athlete, when it comes to sport, because you know body, time, injury, money, it's it's a lot to be a pro athlete, as we've learned. Right, and you have to have some some world class gifts. Right, right. everybody <laughs> doesn't have that. I mean, this is. You know, this is, you talk about being top 100 in the world at anything. This isn't just your average person just waking up and just, you know, learning how to hit a ball and then you're going to be top 100 and make a living playing tennis. It is not happening that way. You got to have above average talent, above average skills. Um, you got to have coaching, you know, nutrition, all that. Coaching, bit. nutrition. You got to have something weird about you. You got to have something, you know, that, that's sort of the Michael Jordan crazy competitiveness where you would just want to, you know, eat somebody's heart out uh, in order to win, right? <laughs> everybody, everybody doesn't possess that, right? You got to, you have to be somewhat crazy to want to spend, <laughs> to give up your life, right? Travel the world during every holiday um, to give up all types of social um, aspects, to give up prom, to give up junior prom, to give up you know, homecomings in college, to give up having a boyfriend, um, to leave your family for 30 days at a time. you got to be a sick individual to want to do that. And so um, <laughs> you, you, can't just, you can't just like the sport and be good at it. You kind of have to be, you know, Do you notice like that habit. drive in children really, really young, or is that something that can be developed? Um... I think the drive can be developed to a point. I think you can develop collegiate tennis player drive. Mm -hmm. I don't know that you can develop professional athlete drive, professional tennis player drive. That has to be something that the kid really... I mean, you know, you, you can only push a kid so far before they just say, you know what, this is as far as I like to go. Thanks for the push. I think I've had enough. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that... This feels like a good time to transition into um, the professional coaching that you you do. So how did you get involved in professionally coaching Sloan that you do now and when you used to coach Taylor? How did uh, that come about? So I know Taylor. I've known Sheila Towns and Taylor's mother for a long time. Mm -hmm. She was one of the adults playing in the club when I was a kid. Ah! Um, and so uh, when she decided to turn pro, you know, Sheila called me and said, hey, Taylor wants to turn pro, need somebody I can trust to kind of help us through this process. Would you be willing to do it? And so, of course, I did it. Uh, I was still working a full-time job at the time, you know, so I wasn't doing it every day, but I was doing what I could, traveling to. Uh, I was splitting the time with Zena Garrison, so she did half the tournaments. I did half the tournaments. Um, and then we took Taylor from 556 in the world to 90 in the world. Um, and then... Um, Indian Wells 2015, she played doubles with Sloan, and so I met Sloan, met her mother, met her family, um, and, you know, I, I think Sloan is, I always joke, I say Sloan is my favorite person I met in 2015. She reminds me <laughs> a lot of myself, uh, 
Tell so, me why. Tell me why. What's that about? <laughs> what do you see in her that you you respond um, to? Just honest. She's just she is who she is, and she's not going to change for anybody, nor should she. Um, and I'm the same way. Just very genuine, caring, unselfish, um, competitive, but not psychotic. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I like that distinction. <laughs> Do they uh, go together, competitive and psychotic? <laughs> you know what? Some sometimes, right? Come uh, on, are you telling us running around on the ATP and WT our potential um, <laughs> forensic files? You know what? I don't. I don't interact with enough to know. Like, okay, <laughs> just check it. Kind of stay in my circle, you know. I, just check I, it. Because we already have a murder in tennis already this year, so I don't know. We really? follow the news. Yes, oh, yeah. <laughs> um, Robin Hassa's coach has oh, been. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, you know. yeah. uh, but you know, what I, I'm curious about though is, uh, <laughs> we, you know, one of the reasons why we were sort of inspired to reach out to you was because we actually, um, you know, we saw that Taylor was going to be playing um, that very old lady that made all the news this past week, Gail. And so we were just kind of struck by Taylor um, on the ITF circuit and, you know, why that happened and how she can sort of get back into the swing of things. Because some of her, um, some of the folks that she competed with in juniors are on the tour now. What happened to her? What happened uh, to her? Well, everybody develops at their own pace, um, mm -hmm. you know, and... and like I said, this this takes, you know, major, major commitment, right? And the good thing for Taylor is that she's young and she's talented. So she has, you know, time to develop and time to um, figure it out and to, you know, commit herself to the sport. Um, but, again, it's hard. I mean, this is every year. If you're not getting better, then... And everyone else is, you know, then you're kind of getting worse. And so I think you got to just, uh, she's, she's going to get there for sure because she's just that talented. I always say she's one of the most gifted people to ever touch a tennis racket. So she's always going to be within range, um, but a lot has to come together to make a successful pro career. And once those things come together, then you'll see her back where she was a year ago. Now, if you could give her a coach, if you can give her, a if you had, you know, everything at your disposal and you can pick a coach for her, who would you love to see her paired with if you could? Um, you can you pick know, yourself think, if you like. Oh, I, mean, I, I did my time, right? And oh, okay. we, we went from 556 to 90, so, you know, that, that works. That, that works. Um, <laughs> And unfortunately, she met Serena first round. Wait, wait. wait I want to hear. I want to hear the coach. Yeah. So I think I think Zena Garrison was uh, the the right coach for Taylor. You um, do why? I mean, Zena was number four in the world before there was a Venus and Serena. There was Zena, right? And, yeah. and Venus and Serena actually give her give Zena a lot of credit for their development. Um, and I know she still consult. You know, she still talks to him and. Mm -hmm. um, you know, gives them jolts of advice when, when she sees, you know, funny things happening. So um, I think she's a legend, and she knows a lot about the game. Um, and, you know, I don't know too many other African-American women that were top four in the world that are out there available uh, to coach. Are you in touch with her at all? I talk to Zena twice a day. Every Taylor. Day. Oh, Tell Taylor. Zena, I said hello, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I talked to Taylor. Her birthday was yesterday, so everybody tell her happy birthday. Happy um, birthday. Happy birthday, Taylor. But, uh, yeah, we, we spoke at Indian Wells. Okay. Yeah. So how did the relationship between you and Sloan come about? So, like I said, uh, Taylor and Sloan played doubles together last year at Indian Wells. And then, um, um, you know, after Taylor moved on, um, you know, Sloan's mother and I were communicating, and I was – you know, asked to just come aboard just to help out, provide a fresh set of eyes, and, um, you know, we just were filling each other out in the fall, and it ended up being a good relationship, and everything works out, you know, for the better, as you all see. So Three titles, 2015, 2016, I'm telling you. So, yeah. so she's got one of the best tennis moms uh, in the game, and so her mom is always 
look out for her? How do we move the ball forward? How do we advance her career? How do we help her improve? How do we help round out her team? Um, and so we were in touch, and then, you know, everything just kind of went from there. So what does it really mean to be a tennis coach? Because coaching in other sports are so hands-on all the time throughout the game. You know, you've got a basketball coach. They're calling plays. What does it really mean to be a tennis coach? Because I'm going to be honest with you. <laughs> from And I, I'm just going to put it out there. Sometimes Isn't I feel like crazy it's... crazy with this idea, okay? Just so you know. <laughs> I, real I just feel like sometimes it's um, a lot of hand-holding at times and unnecessary because you are out there by yourself. So I imagine so much of it obviously is happening away from the court. But, you know, at the end of the day, you are out there playing by yourself. So what is your role as a coach? How important is it? I mean, um, I mean first of all, there's, let's be clear, there's a difference between a teacher and a coach, right? A teacher teaches you how to hit the ball, and that's it, that's all. But a coach kind of helps you bring it all together. So, you know, as a coach, you got to, there are, there are tons of, I mean, this is a pro tour, right? There's tons of on-court stuff that's happening in practice, right? I mean, this is, you know, tennis is like the sport of a lifetime. So you're always getting better. You're always adding shots to your repertoire, always learning how to play in different areas of the court, um, always trying to tweak and get a little bit more out of your serve. So, there's a ton that happens in practice, right? Don't underestimate. I, I hear people all the time saying, oh, well, you know, most of being a pro coach is to, to make sure they're in good spirits or to just be their confidence. Maybe said. That's, uh, you know, no, no. It's, it's not true. Well, because these are we don't these are get to see folks. practice. Yeah, these are, these are grown folks. They don't need babysitters, right? Um, and thank you. They're certainly in pain babysitting rates for sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. I, I got a 12-month-old, and I babysit him, but... <laughs> no, I mean, you, you you help develop and help move the game forward. Everybody is constantly adding things to their repertoire. And so you look at your set of skills, you look at what you lack, you look at what can improve, look at your wep what your weapons are, how you can make it more of a weapon, and then you think about how all those pieces come together. So, um, you know, the architecture of a point, you know, point construction is key. You hit the ball in the wrong spot and on a pro tour and you're going to get popped to the other side of the court. And so... Um, I think you can't underestimate the role of a coach, even for a professional, on court. Um, and then off the court, you know, you help them manage all the aspects of it. You help them manage all the, the media requests. You help them manage all the um, uh, personal relationships. You help them manage their time. You help them uh, manage their schedule. Help them eat the right foods and work out. I mean, you, it's a lot of pieces. And check your medicine, too. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, so you are a man of many talents. You wear I, many hats. I mean, you know, I think that as a coach, you have to be willing to give up a piece of yourself to become the person that you're trying to help, right? And when you when you sort of get out of your own way as a coach, and you allow yourself to become the player, um, and allow yourself to be in their shoes and take on their family dynamic, take on uh, all of their insecurities and their vulnerabilities, then I think it makes it e not easy, but it makes it more doable to have a successful coaching relationship with somebody. Um, but when you try to make the player you, mm. that doesn't work too well, right? Because they can never be you. And so um, I always say um, getting married helped me be made me a better coach, right? Because it taught me how to share, it taught me how to step. <laughs> <laughs> get out of my own way, right? Uh, and compromise. It's, yours, it's not about you. <laughs> it's not about you, right? Um, and so, you know, the other part about it is mental. You also have to, you know, be their confidant. Um, I don't know if I say be their friend. I mean, I'm 35 and so I'm 23, so I wouldn't say that we're friends. Um, but we do have a good off-court relationship. We have a very healthy off-court relationship, um, which has you know, allowed her to trust me and me to trust her. So. Can you tell me, what do you Before think, you what do you think, uh, go ahead, okay. sorry, what do you think, what's changed for you? What are the sort of the three things that you think, if I could pick three, that's changed in the way that Sloan is going about how she's conducting herself in 2016 than she hadn't, that, that wasn't there before? If, you know, if you're a novice looking and saying, okay, why is Sloan so much better? Sure. 
Well, I don't, I don't know that there was anything that wasn't there before. Uh, like I said, it's just a lot of things have to come together, right? And so you try to get uh, all those things to come together from week to week. And so I think there are really four things when I look at the sport. Um, I think it's preparation. Um, I think it's your effort, it's your energy, and your execution, right? And so as a coach, you know, the biggest thing that I have an opportunity to impact is the preparation. You know, what are we doing uh, leading up to the tournament? What are we thinking? What are we working on? What's the game plan? What are we doing day of? Um, you know, what are, our, what are our opportunities in this match and what are things we need to watch out for? Um, and then the energy, um, the effort, and the execution really is Sloan. And so, you know, three out of those four things are up to Sloan, right? And so she deserves all the credit for her success. Um, because no matter what I tell her to do or what I try to help her do, she's the one that's got to go out there and put the ball in the court in front of 20,000 people. And that's not easy to do, right? Um, and so I would say that those four things are coming together on a more regular basis. Okay. Um, so, you know, kudos to her for bringing, you know, her three things to the table and then, you know, being and allowing me to help her to affect the preparation. Okay. How do you approach a tournament? Do you look ahead at the draw? Everyone says they don't. I mean, do you really, do you go in with a game plan? Do you know, do you say, like, at a major, you know, we want to get this far in order for it to be successful? How do you approach it? Um, I look at the draw. I mean, most people don't look, you know, I know most players don't look at the draw. They try to focus on the next match. Uh, but I look at the whole draw, <laughs> and I look at all the potential matchups. But at the same time, you just take it match by match, right? You never, you never try to. Um, although you know what's ahead of your player, you never try to put that in front of them. You try to just keep them singularly focused on what's in front of them. I mean, to win a professional tennis match takes every ounce of mental and emotional focus and energy, and so you want all of that into the match that's in front of them, not the one that's next, right? Right. Um, so, you know, we just we just take it one match at a time, and um, you know. So that, you're looking at the draw, but you're not saying, "Hey, Sloan, Serena's, you're you're slated to meet her in the quarters." You don't do that. Absolutely not. <laughs> absolutely not. Absolutely not. No. Can you imagine? <laughs> no, nah, we're just um, you know, just. just one match at a time, right? Here are the here are the couple things that we're working on for this match, right? And if we do these things, we'll be in a position to win. She doesn't guarantee victory, but we'll be in a position to win. Or leading up to a tournament, you know, here's what we need to be doing two, two, three, four, five days out of a tournament. Here's when we need to get there to get adjusted to the time change. Here's what we need to be eating, um, you know, ahead of time. Here's how much rest we need. Uh, here's how many matches we need to play. Um, but, you know, the day before the match is when you really start, you know, scouting your opponent, kind of putting little subtle bugs in your player's ear. Okay. Um, uh, getting them to believe, right? Um, and that's, that's basically it. But, you know, for, for the player, it's just the match in front of you. But as a coach, I mean, you can't help but play it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, you know, every time I just <laughs> try to hide my phone, right? I try to hide the draw, hide my phone. So you can... <laughs> but that's it. What do you, how do you feel about on-court coaching? Are you an advocate for it? Do you say, try to stay away from it, call me down as much as you want? Um, obviously, I mean, the, the player has the... the the green light to call you down as much as they want. I mean, what if, they can call you, and what are you going to sit there and say, nope, I'm not coming? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, but I'm sure I mean, you have a conversation about it privately. Like, you know, do you, do you, do you encourage it? Do you discourage it? Um, you know, my, my job is to help the player win tennis matches. And so if, there's, if they feel like they need help, then I'm going to, do my best to help them. I'm never going to call myself out there, right, and inject. Because I was spent. Good evening. Oh. Oh, hello. 
<laughs> oh my god. I interrupt him. Um, fans, we're so sorry. We just had some technical difficulties, so the call ended abruptly with Kamal Murray. And just when it was getting so good, and I was kind of hoping you was about to spill some crazy tea. <laughs> but, so, you know, I mean, perhaps in all good, you know, all things work together. Am I quoting scripture on a Sunday? Anyway, I can't even finish it. So clearly I'm not oh, quoting hallelujah. scripture on a Sunday. Anyway, um, I really want to express my profound gratitude for him coming on to our podcast. You know, though it seemed a little urban. I don't use that G word, Andre. <laughs> You know, it's been a little on the cheap side, you know, we are a little, no. we are missing we a budget, good. you know, you know how we are, but I really appreciate him coming on here, and I thought he gave a really insightful thing, so though the interview may sound like it uh, ended abruptly and it's not finished, yes, that's true, so don't come for us, you know, we know. It's not our we, fault, uh, it's Google's fault. It's Google's fault, it really was Google's fault. Oh, we're going to cut this out, we're going to cut this whole section out, we're going to say, thank you all. <laughs> You have no idea. No, it's how it fine. Ended. You're it's gonna make it fine. nice and easy transition. So we're gonna cut this whole middle no, section. No, it's a wonderful <laughs> transition, Donna. This is how we are. We ain't cutting shit out. Get anyway. it together, Andrew. Moving we're not on. cutting anything. Oh, you know on. better. Anyways, what happened so. in tennis this week? Oh yeah. Yes. So <sighs> hmm. where do we where start? Do Actually, are you gonna? Are you guys gonna come for me? Are you gonna come for my fave? Actually, we're we're not gonna come for no, your fave. Let me no, deal with the no. easy stuff. Let me deal with the easy stuff. Okay. Did not remember, wait, first and foremost, there was a tournament in Bogota. Yeah, let's get rid of that one. Let's Sorry. get rid of that really quickly. Yes, yes you know. Arena Falconi. <laughs> oh my God, I love when Janina goes. What? Something else? Oh, Arena for twenty one. Because I was co-boarding it and I didn't know whether she won. Yeah, yes. she won. <laughs> Okay. Irina Falcone, and she beat Sasha uh, Vickery in the semifinals, another American. Irina Falcone, I think she's from Jer- Jersey. I'm mm-hmm. not sure. But that might be Christina McHale. Who knows? Anyway, these Americans are probably around 12 and the fed up team anyway. But anyway, Irina, you made some money this week. And congratulations, girl. You beat Can I borrow some? Sola <laughs> Espinosa. I forget what her first name is, but, you know, mm-hmm. you beat her. And in three sets, that's a really good win, you know. Down dirt clay, whatever you get. get a little confidence, a little money, and a trophy for your bedroom. Ain't Woo-hoo. nobody's gonna be mad at you for that. Woo-hoo. But anyway, most of the week the ladies were in their various Fed Cup ties and surprise, surprise, Czech Republic is in the Fed Cup finals again. Look. Ah. Um, yeah. All right. The good sweet. for you. Okay. And they didn't they didn't even eat Petra. They didn't well, need I mean, pitch. but you know who they needed? They needed Swiss players. Yes, I mean, they needed Belinda Bencic. How, 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 I thought Tamia was turning things around. Did she lose all of her, th- I Listen, guess she did. She let lost me tell everything. You something. Let me tell you something about <laughs> Tamia. Oh, no. I think that her tennis would be so much better if she could just stand up straight. <laughs> She's got this perpetual hunch in her shoulders that drives me crazy. It's almost like the Milos effect. Yeah. And I just want to be like, bitch, stand up. Well, stand up. You, you probably could have told stand her that up. over Capet. No. I think she was no. very upset, right? She was no I mean, I hate to say it, but it's like it's like when you try to go for the three pointer to, to, to seal the game and it flies wide. Everyone knows yeah, that like, you in points, right? You it's ain't like Steph Curry, you. okay? <laughs> I Look, feel for her. I feel for her. Camille, I don't know what's going on in your life, girl. I don't know if you need to check back into a hotel and, you know, perhaps get your, your old day job all over oh, again. But, no. you know, no tea, no shade to, to, to Strykova. But, girl, ain't no way. No way Strykova Barbara is supposed to be dragging your ass. A bagel, right? A bagel, Ever. I think it was. In that manner. Okay. You are not some new girl that just came on the toke. You're not, a, you're not a junior. You're not even a senior. You're an experienced <laughs> player, okay? This is your second life on tour. And you come back to be bageled? Look, Tamia, I don't care if you had lost the Barbara. That would have been fine to me. But at least win six games, perhaps? I don't know. So was it... I mean, I didn't get a chance to see a single point of her match. But does it have, did it have... To, was it about nerves for her? Was that her issue? Because I, I would have assumed that was a better Google, matchup. Whatever the other Swiss girl well, name. They had no expectations of her, and she saved the I, whole weekend. Exactly. <laughs> that's, that's, what how you want, that's how you want to come out, Victoria. <laughs> that's, I, mean, I think seriously. that's her name, Victoria. And she has a beautiful single-handed backhand. I'm just saying, Timmy, a girl. 
You just needed to win one match, just one. Well, one, see, what people, I mean, like somebody, was, I, I think I can't remember was it um, Tumani Carol, I think. Yeah. If I'm this thing, he mentioned, "Is this how we try to convince Martina to play singles?" <laughs> I bet you any time Martina would not have lost Barbara to, to bagel her out. You know what, Timmy? I, I got. She no didn't idea. deliver the doubles points either. Ooh. Ooh. They, oh. Well, listen. My team is saying, you know, if I have my home girl Belinda on my team, you maybe, know, but Belinda, yeah. hmm, Belinda, I don't, hmm, Belinda. She have back hmm. issues. She's she's got back issues. She's out hmm. of she's she's out of several tournaments actually. I think. Okay, Belinda, I'm gonna let Andre have have the word on this one, but but you <laughs> see, I saw some pictures, girl. I saw That's some why. pictures. That's why she has not been training. That's why because of her lower back. Whatever. Okay. All right. All right. <laughs> When she Belinda, comes back, you got and an she's, excuse. Yes, you when she comes back, yes. I give you a doctor's note, okay? okay. <laughs> I know what you're coming for her for. <laughs> okay, because you know, I talked about you on a, that little weekend, a little Christmas vacation we went away, and I saw you, girl, but you know what? Andre and save you, so, you know, I keep my mouth shut for, you know, for now. Say anything for now. For now. For now. For now. When she comes back, you can drag her. Okay. Anyway, you know, because I like to see you playing. And hey, I think guess you will what? What? I didn't watch any Fed Cup. I don't blame you. And not, because the real excitement was not in all over the world. We, Our attention could not have been divided. We All eyes were focused on Monte Carlo. But Wait, anyway, let me just know, say, the oh, USA? America won their Fed Cup full love. I, I, I yeah. I, yeah. Um, brutal. Um, no. Brutal. Brutal. Oh, oh. oh yes, I know. Oh wait, I, mean, I lied. I, mean, I did watch a little bit of the first match with yeah. Madison Keys and whoever she played. I did see a little bit of that, Damn, but so that's sad. it. No, no Gabber, she didn't Gabber, play. No, Gabrielova. Um, Gabrielova. Yeah. I, I saw a little bit of that. That was the extent of my Fed Cup weekend. That's it. Nothing so, Andrean, I know you have a burning testimony in your heart this Sunday evening. Let us hear it. <laughs> I. Say the word. Uh, okay, I, I don't know. I accidentally, on purpose, watched Fed Cup. It was actually the perfect time. It was like 7 o'clock in the evening, 8 o'clock. Perfect time to just lay down and watch some Fed Cup on Tennis Channel. So I miss Madison Keys giving the beat down to Gavrilova, who apparently was very nervous, and this was her first time playing as an Aussie because she um, immigrated. So that was sad for her. Girl, you need some Eldonium? You're always nervous. I keep hearing that from you. <laughs> oh, Gabriel, you know, I, I know. I'm over this goddamn yet. Darren, I am oh. over this talk about you and nerves, okay? Oh. Get yourself some Eldonium. You're a former Russian. Don't tell me you don't know where to go get this. Stop you know, it. So get it. You can order it get on the internet, it. apparently. I know. So, Christine, and and just Kale. make sure you have that point, point something, whatever you have, and, you know, just make sure you, you take half a tablet, okay? Just half. Mm -mm. Okay? Every other week. Reels. So, so Christina Shit. McHale. <laughs> Christina McHale. You know, you, we all know Christina McHale. McPhail. Yeah, right. I'm the only one here that likes her. Yeah. I mean, I like her fine, but the, 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 thing, the, the thing we know about Christina is Christina can be up a set and a break, set on several breaks, and she will be mm. losing in the third. Mm -hmm. so, but <laughs> Christina, <apparently> Christina <laughs> Wilkes really had to get, the, get a lead and worked even harder <laughs> to lose it. Christina but you know McPhail. What? Can I tell you, though, she had a new strategy this week. Her strategy was, I'm going to let Sam Soser go up and <laughs> and can, I, can I tell you, Sam Soser was playing... They're playing in America, right? No, no, they actually, they, the Americans actually flew down to Aussie. So Sam Soser lost in front of Aussie crowd. I mean, is isn't that normal? It, I mean, it, I mean... It, 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 but I you mean, know what? But we have to talk about this. We have to talk about what's wrong with her. Because she was up reels as set and to love. Twice. <sighs> look, twice. look. Twice. You ain't and, telling me nothing that Sam Sosa has not done before oh in, in Australia. God. It was, you know what? It was incredible to watch it, though. I have to say, as much time as you talk about someone choking... It was incredible to watch her do it because and in the first set, oh yeah, yeah she, the first set she was she was hitting her she was hitting the ball so cleanly she was smiling she was happy and giddy and loving life, and Alicia Malik looked like she was like oh, I'm happy I chose Sam you know, and it was and then I have no idea what happened. Second set, she just simply went away. The, you know that you you could tell when when things go right right the forehand starts spraying. 
<laughs> there ain't no backhand to back it up. It's typical. <laughs> there ain't no yeah. backhand. If the forehand starts spraying, that's it. Oh my god! And she, I mean, she, she, she looked like she started. It looked like she was gonna be crying. It looked like she was crying. It Sam looked look like, like she was crying. crying? Yes, she but it's that look that you know that pain, concern look on the face, and it was so interesting to hear Lindsay Davenport. <laughs> Lindsay <brutal>. Davenport. <laughs> she she could be brutal. Lindsay yeah. Davenport. She actually said, "This is somebody who's mentally just not strong." <laughs> <laughs> Lazy, lazy, no, lazy. You're, I'm gonna need to see receipts for that because lazy. My mother calls you lady, lazy. Okay, she be oh dragging your ass when you were in your professional career. Just look at her. Just look at her across the net. She's not even giving any effort. Any energy, just look oh, at her. Fuck. But you know what? I will say though, that was I mean, Lindsay was always a really good ball striker, and she was she was actually really good. But you could never tell that Listen. she. That she no. was working hard. It always looked like she was laboring. <laughs> Murray, Murray fabricated his game after Davenport's. <laughs> Looks like you're gonna die at any given moment. That's why I always hated her. Oh my I hated God. her because I'm like, you don't know if she's gonna fall over or if she's gonna hit a winner. No. <laughs> so, you know what? no, you guys, <clears throat> some of our listeners, and I'm sure the two of you can probably relate to this. I remember watching Lindsay Davenport when I was young, thinking that she looked like a pound puppy. Y'all remember the pound puppies? I remember the pound puppy, but I don't remember pound puppy and Lindsay Davenport looking like each other. But okay. She had them droopy eyes. <laughs> no. Yeah, yeah. L- Lindsay, you know what? It was so funny. No, Lindsay always looked. I mean, I, I love Lindsay as a commentator because she she is She's great. very insightful. She does not back away from talking about the truth because and that's why I watch her she's like sometimes and she was like stunned she was like wow just look at it just look at it all happen just look at it fall apart you know it was like an experiment it was like I mean it was like Sam I mean it was the worst possible situation you have Sam Stoser who does not perform well in Australia what do they do they get Sam Stoser Put her on clay in Brisbane in front of her crowd and said, "Hey, <laughs> clay go is get two points." Office. Supposedly, go get two points. <laughs> oh and she God. was on her way both times because against uh, not one of the Williams sisters, none of them are there. <laughs> They're not there. Maybe that's you know? the only time she brings it. And then I think she had a chance to take the match against Coco. I think who I think Coco actually has a winning head to head against her, and I think she framed an overhead. And I was like, you know what? It's the Joker smash. (laughs) But I mean, but I was just sitting there thinking to myself, there's so much sympathy. Is she the most sympathetic choker ever? Because everyone else gets lashings when they choke, but Sam gets all the forgiveness in the world. She's a slam winner. No, no. I'm going to throw a name out there, and I bet you Janina's going to be like, who the fuck are you talking about? Yeah. Oh. Anna Chuck with that say. I'm sure I have that. <laughs> yeah, I know that name. I know that oh, name. Oh, love. Uh, Anna Chuck with that say. Chuck with that say. Yeah, we have seen her melt down so many times in tears. Vera Zavanna Raver, some of those, you see, this is why, Maria, this is, I know this is why you got that meltdown. This is why you were like, not like the rest of the Russians. Because they are all fragile mentally, but Maria, you got meldonium. But, you know, I think, I mean, you you posed so a question, um, an interesting question. Why is Sam Stosa not getting lashing for being meltdown, for, for, you know, for failing since the 2011 um, U.S. Open win over Serena? But Mike's answer to that is that, uh, the reason she doesn't get it because Sam Sosa has defied every single expectation there's ever been, and she's such an anomaly. People just don't want that repeat. So they're just like, you know, just pat her on the back. So hopefully she just go away quietly. Don't encourage this. Don't don't make her feel like she can do this again. Uh oh. Because I'll tell you why. When I knew Sam Sosa, she was a doubles player. Sam Sosa was never a singles player because. In the day when Lindsay Davenport, Martina, Monica was going quietly going out, Jennifer Capriati and those people two thousand, you could not be on tour without a backhand without a backhand. You just couldn't. You would be murdered. There were too many Justine and Kim. Kim what Kim couldn't run around her backhand. I mean like you would be murdered if you didn't have a backhand on tour. And Sam Stosa couldn't survive in that those circumstances. So she was a doubles player. She's one of the older gals on tour, if I'm not mistaken. Older yeah, ladies. Yeah. 
And I think she made a decision at some point to, you know, you know, focus on her singles career somewhat. And in 2011, you know, she saw that caught lightning in the bottle. Right? I think that's the year that she won to, she got to the final, um, the French Open as well. Was it 2011 the or French 2000? Open? Yeah, she got to the French Open in 2011, and she know. lost. Yeah, she lost the ski of only 2010. I'm sorry, Lena won in 2011. Um, she got to the finals in 2010 and she lost badly to Skiavoni. And people were like, what? But, you know, she was like, you know, bid my time and then US Open. She caught lightning in the battle. She found Angie. She bid a lot of inexperienced player. The pressure wasn't really on her because of the rain. She didn't have to be on the big show coach. You know, she I think she played her semifinal on Armstrong or even probably Grandstand or someplace like that. So, you know, she caught lightning in the battle. Serena was a mess. That, so she won. And... That's why she's Eva Maioli of this generation. Stop Eva Maioli it. won. Whoever that is. Eva Maioli beat Martina Hingis in 1997 French Open and had Eva Maioli lost, Martina Hingis would have won the Grand Slam because she made every single final that year. She was like, she had a Novak year, a Federer year, I should say. Federer years where you get to all four mm -hmm. finals and then. So I think that's why no one really cares about Sam Stolzer because really and truly, can you see Sam Stolzer working her way through another Grand Slam draw, really? I mean, I mean, I think, it, 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 yeah, I mean, it's it's just one of those things where she's just really unreliable. I do. Sometimes she can string together three or four really good wins, and then if the if the situation is right, maybe something good can happen to her, right? Like, that's what happened to her at the U.S. Open. The situation was just right. She encountered a very um, problematic Serena, and she was able to take that run and, and win it. But... I just every single time the Australian thing, I can't. I mean, like, what is she gonna need? What does she need to do to get over that? It's like I don't understand that. It's like what pretend, put Sam on coat pretend number eighteen. You're, yeah, pretend you're living. Pretend you're playing. I don't know in the back in your backyard. Like what? What is <laughs> it? I mean, have the tie in New Zealand. <laughs> That's what I keep saying. She should have probably the do a way tie. It was a mess. No, I mean, I just you know, I just watched it and I just thought, dear lord, and a. Uh, there went Andrew. Hold on. You just say that again, Andrew. No, I said the, uh, the same thing for <laughs> Caroline Garcia. Oh. Okay, am I gone? Yeah. No, you're back now. Back now. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's French. Well, I don't know if that's a problem. There's a person a problem with Caroline Garcia. Maybe just like a French problem because, you know, the French people are. Hmm. Stop. But they yeah. reined it in, and they won. They won. They won a really yeah, nice... Yeah, I mean, like, you know, Amelie, Amelie's on top of that. You know, Amelie's not fucking around, okay? She left Murray yeah, in the wilderness knows. in Monte Carlo, and she mm -mm. stuck with my lady. <laughs> you know, she, she was not... She was That ship was not going down, okay? Kiki, I don't know what the fuck you were doing, but, you know, that ship was not going down. She and we had friends... She was tight in the doubles. She was tight in yes. the doubles. As she should be, but you know, so wonderful to see France and Czech Republic in the Fed Cup final, and that should be rather exciting. Hopefully, especially if it's in France, because those French girls are gonna yeah. be wild and wassy. But anyway, enough about the ladies. Did we forget? You know, I think Belarus won. Um, Romania went was relegated outside of the world group. Um, Chinese Taipei, I think, beat um, Poland. So no Aga next year for her. What? Aga, don't worry. You you still got that um Hotman Cup, so that counts, right? <laughs> that counts. <laughs> let, don't let anybody shade your Hotman Cup, okay? And you did it with a guy, so you had good company. Oh, okay? So anyway, moving on to the Are real. You gonna talk about Monte Carlo now? Drama of the week. Uh, all right, all right, all right. You're so happy, let's bring it. You watch tennis, Janina, this week. You watch tennis. It so we are we're finally on the real with the men on clay, right? That's true, right? Mm -hmm. Red dirt. The real clay coach. Not the outside tournaments in South America, which usually used to be Ferrera. You know, we're in real dirt, Monte Carlo. Well, Monte Carlo, Monte Carlo. Though it's in France, whatever. I think all clay courts anyway. should be blue. I'm just saying. Hmm. You want somebody to get a hazard? Can like people get mad? I'm not coming back here if it's gonna be blue. Okay? No. 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 Now we. Now we. No bueno. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. No exercise. The boycott. 
<laughs> no back to say it's a boycott tournament. Maybe a few people were like, well, I might have a chance of winning some money <laughs> at some point. Well, you know, I didn't I was, make it. I was trying to remember today who actually beat Novak in Monte Carlo, and I don't know, but it doesn't matter because he Yuri lost. Yuri Vaselli. Yuri Vaselli. I mean, we have to talk about that. That's the first thing. So I know, Yuri but Vaselli. I couldn't remember who it was. Yeah. I'm gonna set. I'm gonna set the Novak haters who listen to our podcast on fire right now. I'm gonna say this, Yuri Vaselli. You saved men tennis this week, and Amen. you get a big round of applause. <laughs> Who too? Do you, I'm telling you. Do you think? I mean, do you think Rafa's pressure. gonna send him a basket? Should Rafa send him? Oh a yeah. Basket? I think Rafa, he's probably gonna send him a basket can... and some underwear. Fuck that shit, Rafa! You send him a check. <laughs> you don't need the money. You don't need the money, Rafa. You don't need the money. Send Yuri that money because that would make Yuri's year. Because I don't even see Yuri around the place anyway. So you know he's on the challenger circuit. I do. And you no, know. No, no, no. He he, and he plays often Yuri enough. Get some braces. Just saying. Oh, a little mean. So... But, you mean, but you know what? I have to say that you know that I actually um, it was a very enjoyable match. Um, I don't know what was the reason, and no <laughs> team was saying, hey, <laughs> I honestly do not believe that Novak is beatable. And sometimes I question when he loses his match if this is for real or for fake. <laughs> you know, so, but you know. But nevertheless, yeah, the like the- y- you know what? It's hard. I totally understand you, because it's not because because Nole played like crap all through the through the um the hardcore season, the spring hardcore season. I still found himself winning <laughs> exactly, and, and still won most of his sets, and still yeah. got two titles. So it's not to say that suddenly Yuri Vesely has gotten a formula and how beat Nole. So in a weird way, even though the win was wonderful because it allowed new people to get to the draw, from that. it didn't mean anything. <laughs> it was <laughs> it was just coming, right? Exactly, because the people yeah. that I know he's going to meet, like, when, because this is an anomaly, right? For people, they're going to be like, oh, his fans were like, you know, you rest up, you know, because it's so much of a big effort. You rest up because, you know, your eyes on the prize in Paris. I don't think you're going to win Paris this year again. Just... Some people just not guaranteed to win anything. Some things, you know, just no the way it is. No one guaranteed. Michelle Kwan never won Olympic gold, and she's the best fucking figure skater there was. Just saying. Well, there you go. Nothing is guaranteed. But anyway, on the low. So, but, I mean, I watched the match, and I have to say that, you know, if, at the end of the day, Yuri Vaselli, um, he didn't punk out. He was like, you know what? This is a chance. I know what the fuck he's doing over there, but I'm going to take this. And next round money is better than this round money. So he took it. And he served out the match, which I thought was very impressive because, you know, usually... Yeah, it's a perfect time to choke, right? <laughs> it's the only time to choke. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, it just drives me insane. But, I mean, like, and he was clearly thinking about every point, point by point. He wasn't getting ahead of himself. He tried a crazy drop shot. And it worked for him. So, you know, luck was on his side and he really put it together, and you know. Maybe he was drunk off that win next time around. You know, he had an Ali Zekone moment, you know. <laughs> like, just three and then can't win a set the next round. <laughs> so, um, it was really, that I thought was very impressive. And I think that sort of, like, lift the tone of the tournament because it, it sort of allowed people to feel like, oh, my God, Nole isn't going to take this title again. Uh, again. You know, yeah, I, I felt it changed. I'm not, not, I'm not shading Nole. Though, yeah, I would really just shade but... God, well, it just sometimes it, it just men's tennis was getting boring and dull, and you cannot buy this final that you had. It. I mean, this final was fucking amazing. The first two sets. Well, I didn't Andrina, get to are you actually still with us? see. Hold on, wait, wait. Okay. I I didn't get to see Novak win. I was live scoring the match. Novak lost. I was, or yeah, lost. I'm so used to saying he won. <laughs> see how that win. works? <laughs> oh God, I'm brainwashed. But yeah, I I, did, I was live scoring it, and I was at a meeting, <laughs> and people are like, "What are you talking about?" <laughs> oh, you know, nothing. Everything's everything's fine. As I sit there and talk to myself, oh my god, is he gonna do it? Is he gonna lose? <laughs> this is really happening, and it really happened. I was at work watching it, and I was like, oh, "Fuck! What the fuck are you doing? What?" <laughs> Drop shot, no. Oh, yes, it worked. Yes, yes. Oh, my God, he's going to do it. It's 40-15. Oh, my God. Uh, I'm, I'm sad I, mean, I didn't get to see it, but whatever. 
ended on a Nole era. To me, Nole checked out. <clears throat> Did he? Yeah. Well, I he think said he, he was out. tired, right? He was like, "This is a he." He said something along the lines of, "This is a welcome to break." Yeah, he's he, tired. Well, I mean, he's he clearly tired. checked. Yeah. Understandably, he's tired. I mean, my God. He's been playing and winning everything week in and week out for yeah. like 11 billion years. So, <laughs> hey, take a break, Nola, because you know what? What we got today was special. Haven't seen yeah, that kind you know, of tennis I in a long that time. Restaurant, that joke a place. I don't know what it's called. <clears throat> but I mean, before like, we get I... to the final, let's talk about you know things that happened before the final. Like our fave Federer is back, and you know what? He looked fucking good. He did. I thought he was going to be moving more care. Carefully, but he was moving really well. He moved I mean, great. He moved really he moved well. Great. He slid up to the ball. He had some awkward. He had some awkward turns on the court, and I was like, "Oops," you know, because obviously now you're just looking at everything. Right, right. The, the, only, the only problem with him was his sharpness, which is something that yeah, only comes out of match play. Like, it, yep. I mean, there were there were times when he could have broken Sangha, like when he could have broken Sangha to take it to a tie break in the right. third set. I mean, those two points that he lost were his to lose. He lost those. Yep. Like, Sangha didn't win them. He lost them because of that. <laughs> I mean, he Wolf hasn't played Wally, in what? Wally. Like, close to two months or two months? A quarterfinal result? That's not bad. I'm happy with it. Look, As a Federer fan. You, you people say quarterfinal result like it's quarterfinals at the majors. No, he just won two matches. So okay? what? It is what it um, is. For the, I mean, for this week, I was kind of a bit of a bitch. You know, because to me, I wanted more and I didn't get it. And, you know, I was like, I couldn't see the silver lining in many of these clouds that were gray clouds that were floating around You're such around a baby. Me. I know, I know, but sometimes I want what I want, and I want it now, you know. But, you know, the world doesn't work on my schedule, unfortunately. But, I mean, he played well. I saw his first two matches, and, I, you know, I'm always happy when Sangha could get a win, you know, a quality win, you know, make him feel like he's somebody still, you know. <laughs> and, the same. And usually, unfortunately, that's always at the expense at Federer. Wimbledon, <laughs> Montreal, True. now here again. True. I mean, like, look, Federer, you are not Sangha's punching bag, okay? Just not. You know, well, so... you know, there was that year. Remember, there was that wonderful year. I think it was 2012 where they met quite often. Yeah, because he lost in Wimbledon, but then he beat him at the World Tour Finals. And then he no, 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 no. I meant like there was it. Was it what was it? Two thousand eleven. There was that. Yeah. There was a period where they met often. It was yeah. like a year of I sanghas, Fidanga, yeah. right? There was like all sorts of sanghas, right? sangha et cetera, just... Sundays. It was ridiculous. I think it might have even been the Paris finals. That's when Fed won Bercy for the first time, and then mm. you know Sangha meet Sangha beat Rafa at the World Tour finals, and he played Federer. I think in the final. So um, it was great, you know. <laughs> So I'm just yeah. saying, you know, my point they're, is just... Their you know, games match up well. They do. It, it usually Sanga. makes for a fun match. Yeah, but Sangha, you know, I, I can't stand you people, okay? Y'all acting really scrubbish. Y'all see Federer over this old man. I'm like, I'm going to beat up this old man. <laughs> you know, I'm gonna beat and I mean, I guess in some respect, you know, as a Federer fan, I could take some, you know, take some positive from this because, you know, look... You still consider Federer to be a threat, and whatever the case may be. But fuck that shit. When y'all see Nole and then y'all see Raph over there, y'all are acting all scrubbish and be like, ah, oh, I don't know, I can't play, I don't know what to do. Fucking errors off every. No, I ain't got time for that. <laughs> but don't you know what, though? You know what, though? It's because of the nature, it's be the nature Federer, of the nature of your game. No, no, it's the nature of the game, right? Because Federer has played such an aggressive Andrea style. Andrea talking sense. And right about, no, I ain't about I know, sense. you don't want no sense. <laughs> I don't want no sense. What I wanted was Federer to, to put away Sangha oh in straight sense. God. You know, I wouldn't have mind because, you know what? I thought Federer probably could have taken Nadal in the finals, but that's just me saying that. But did Nadal I saw in the finals today? Honey, maybe that honey. A double. And I wasn't here for that because I was gonna walk to Monte Carlo oh and I was gonna pull it out off the court. I'd be there. Fuck no, you're not gonna beat my man one more time. I'm hurt. It wow. would not happen. Just wouldn't happen. No, you are officially you know, delusional. Yeah, he's gone crazy. But you know what's really good about it? This for the first time, Federer loses early enough to not impact his head to head against these people. Because whenever they're not doing well, they lose early. That's right? what they do. 
<laughs> and Federer so always true. gets his ass to the final. I was like, I was sitting there thinking, Federer is about to get to this Monte Carlo final, having no match play, and try to beat Rafa on on clay. Absolutely <laughs> not. <laughs> Ain't happening, right? <laughs> I'm I just not because, not because I actually, thought he couldn't do it. Actually, <laughs> I didn't even think Nadal was even going to make the final because, you know, I figured well, that Dominic team was had a do million it. and one break point <laughs> and maybe, just maybe Dominique, you know, you would have taken, you know, more than one. Just saying, yeah, you know, weird. two, three, you know, any of the 13 of the 50 million that you had. You know, all we needed was just six, three in the first set and three in the second set. You know, but no, you were like, you got time to put up some Facebook bullshit. I ain't got Uh-oh. time to dominate. You were looking, so obviously you do have time. I'm just I want to. I don't, I, don't have, I don't have time to hear how about I, I could have, should have, would have won this match and tough titty for me this week. You know, but probably, no. Rafa was playing basic tennis, and you decided, you know what, the game was, how low can you go? You play basic <laughs> tennis. Let me see how worse I can do out here. Because I mean, like, oh you do God. not get fifty million break points. Better yeah, right? I'm super well, not convert. Yeah. Just saying. Rafa wasn't doing anything special. Okay, what I mean, like you were with him toe for toe. But you know, know. what? I was I, like, I really Dominic don't get him. him. Like maybe you know, maybe Stanley might get him. No. Oh my like, god, but, but I think Stan got good. the worst beating of all of them. I was shocked, I have to say. When I got up, I was like, I thought, I thought because, you know, Stan had handled Simone, not that Simone is Rafa, but, you know, I just thought that Stan must be playing good ball because, you know, Simone could be a bit of a mm-hmm. nag on the court. Sure. So when I woke up and I saw, what was it, 6-love, six 6-1 six or something like six that? 6-1, 6-3 or something like that. No, I tell you what happened. <laughs> Stanley, let me tell you something. I mean, people are going to get mad at this, whatever, you know. Donna can't be around you, okay? You need concentration, you know. Donna put the good there. good on top of you that night before, and somehow you create up. And now you can see after that, you know, I don't care how good Raph is played. I just want, I think Federer could win the, win the tournament. And sure enough, Federer lost. You blight him, Stanley. You <laughs> oh blight God. Federer. It was your mouth. You never give Federer props in the. It's in true. The you never it do. Reverse. It because you're karma. bitter and you're jealous. <laughs> and you're oh my God! I know the Stanley haters got Stanley fans gonna be mad at me. For saying that That's strong. all right. I'm a hater, but Reels, I hate Reels, people. why are you so off this week? What is going on with you? You I'm feel right. like I'm you're right. angry this week. You're ripe. No, because you know it was business as usual this week. At ATP, no matter what. But it wasn't business as usual no, because wasn't. we had a Novak less final. Very entertaining. By the way, I tweeted that out and got attacked by Nole fans. Of course and, you did. Um, it was. I was like. I was like memo to Nole. This is an entertaining final. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I mean, listen, and I completely understand. It's not Nole's fault that he's like maybe ten times better than everybody else. But you know what? For my own entertainment, you've got to adjust yourself. If you feel like you're playing at ten and everybody else is playing at five, you need to move yourself down to seven just to make it interesting. Yes. Please. <laughs> and if Stanley That's can horrible. get the job done, I thought, you know, I, I, to much to my surprise, local favorites around these parts, Andrew Murray was going to get the job done against Steve Adam. Oh, oh, I'm telling you, that first set, I have never seen yeah, Murray play that kind of well tennis. It was Murray. brilliant. It was crisp. Yeah. That backhand was working magic. But then, you know, Dee Vidal took a bathroom break, you know, and, you know, I don't know what he did, you know, change. He shirt. took some meldonium. Oh, mm. my God. Stop yourself. You, you can't, can't say sorry. meldonium to sorry. Dee Vidal. No. And I'm oh. sure, you know, Dee Vidal don't, barely speaks English. You don't read Okay, Russian, fine. So he I'm changed his clothes. He felt fresh, and he was he good to go. felt fresh. And then, you know, Dee Vidal got smart. He was just like, oh, so this Andy backhand is working, right? So... Let me just go to that full hand, and he peppered that full hand till it was, till that full hand became like a two hand. Like he just broke that full hand down for everything it worked. And Andy, just you know, couldn't get out of his way to even try to reconstruct points. And then he just fizzled in the third set. Mm. Yeah, like everybody. Else. Andy, it was, I know. You know, I, I mean, like, I have to say, and, and, you know. 
Actually, no. Actually, this is what I find interesting about Andy Murray, and I think he has some kind of mental issues that need to be resolved. I know he got mad and upset when people spoke about this before he won majors and said people insulted him, but let's be 100 here fans, okay? Tennis, fa tennis players are real people, and if we accept in the wider world that they are people with mental issues, I don't know why we think people who pick up a tennis racket somehow immune to mental issues. And what I saw from Andy Murray, I don't remember who he played in the... It was probably the round of 16. Fucking mess. Like, he's cursing everybody. And to one point, he Benoit had a lot of obscenity. And he... Yes, it was Benoit Pair. It was crazy. I mean, it was so ridiculous. And Benoit... I can't even talk about you, Benoit. I can't even. You know, you used to be. Oh, thank God I dropped your ass last year because ooh, uh -oh. out of punch. Mm -mm, no, no. But he. I mean, Andy Murray was just ridiculous. I mean, like every single match, most matches, this guy is cursing like a sailor. And I know people think this is just spirit and this is but but this is disgusting. It's ridiculous because you know, sure enough, when he comes to play Diva Dow, he ain't gonna pat him out anymore. Mm -mm. He took that beat in like a man and just took it. He just had to be internalized, all that shit. Just like, mm, 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 mm. <laughs> but what he decided to do was try to hit the umpire. That's what he decided to do in the end. Trying to, I, uh, that is disgusting. Twice. I don't know what's going to happen to that. And I find it strange. Nothing's you know, going to happen with it. The, the, the so called feminist, but that could not have been Nick Kyrgios. I'm just saying it. We all know that it couldn't have been Nick Kyrgios. And what happened? Hit, for for those of us who didn't like, see the match, actually, he hit so the umpire. The, yeah, so once first he, he took the ball and struck it to um, hit the um, the chair, the umpire's chair. Then mm -hmm. I think in the third set, um, the Jimmy umpire Swan, was that, coming down the, on to check a down to check a light, and as he was walking back, and he said the ball was out, and Demari hit one. He had two balls in his pocket. None of the break us off. He <laughs> hit the ball that are not his balls, you know, the yellow ones. Uh, I don't know what just anyway. He hit the first ball, ball into the net. The so chair. he hit the first ball into the net. And then the second ball, as the umpire was walking away, he hit the ball to the umpire. The umpire had to ca actually caught the ball. <laughs> and he said to Andy, you know, you think I'm stupid, basically. I know what you're doing. He said, right. Andy, I'm not and stupid. Him, you hit the ball towards me twice. Blah, blah, blah. And Andy was just and like Andy trying said, to be like... said, you're just making stuff up. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was like I was watching a five-year-old. It's like, you didn't see what I just... You didn't see that. <sighs> and he just like, the umpire has the ball in his hand, Andy. Like, he has it in his hand. He didn't pick it up off the ground. He caught the ball you, you hit at him. And even his Andy's um, commentator pals addressed this issue too and said, you know, like, oh, yeah, he can probably get in trouble for this. It was not okay <laughs> anymore. You're the number two player in the world. This is not cute. You're a father. You have a daughter. Oh, whatever. Don't you know, even these are the things that you want to talk about. Your wife is at the side there. You know, you have all of, you know, Scotland behind His wife, you. who was yelling in the stands, you fucking check, check, fuck, or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they go together great. Look, don't even look. try to play that I have to get I came on that, I have to get on Merca, and I don't mess with Merca, okay? Merca doesn't say Merca. anything. She no, just she... smiles and checks her phone. <laughs> Right. Like, what am I gonna do? She's perfect. Yeah, <laughs> like we're gonna pretend like she didn't check Stan ass a couple years ago. Like, we're not we'll talking about that. Dip it. <laughs> no. Listen, these ladies, these ladies are feisty. That's um, right. But no, I mean, I think it was. I mean, you know, my thing with Andy Murray is that I, I've always thought Andy Murray was way too, way too docile in his interaction with Rafa. And he needed to he needed to just come on and expect to be Rafa's rival. Yeah, you know if what I, I mean? If like I that's, he can't be. Rival. He isn't good enough. As yeah, much as he he actually, him. I don't know no, if that's he true. No, he can't handle Rafa on clay, clearly. No, yes, he can. Because he's actually one of the few that's actually beaten Rafa on clay. And he, he handled him well in last year. In the, no, but even here, the 6-2 set was fantastic. It's not that Rafa changed anything up too much. Yeah, exactly. I think it's just because Andy decided to go away mentally. I don't know what happened. Got irritated. Maybe he bucked his toe. Maybe, you know, who knows? Maybe his underwear was too tight. What? I mean, who can ever figure out why Andy decides to go away? Yeah. But <laughs> while, while we're on this subject, let me just say this. I, um, 
and we can get into the finals and you know I have some good things to say about David Al, his fans who probably checked out whatever you know I'm not coming for everybody's week this week but anyway um I have to say that you know overall I've watched this tournament you know meticulously I have to say that some of these top guys and I'm calling now Nole sorry not Nole sorry not Nole not Nole Nadal and Murray y'all are full of shit your gamesmanship is fucking poor so there is Andy Murray talking about Nadal spending too much time between points. And you surely check the clock. Andy Murray on average is 27 seconds between points. <laughs> and Dean Nadal is 31 <laughs> seconds between points. So both of you motherfuckers are over the clock, right? You're <laughs> over the time. Then Dean Nadal, of course, take these long bathroom breaks, which supposedly is permissible at this point. Because to me, just like if someone is going in there and checking someone, if, if because players are not allowed to leave the court by themselves, you don't go into yeah. the bathroom myself. Then someone should be like, "Motherfucker, you're in their pain. You're not taking a piss. You need to get the fuck back out here." Because screaming at yourself in the mirror and doing all this shit, whatever. <laughs> you had to poo. It's not. <laughs> Look, if I'm you want to poo, you are not walking gingerly off the court if you gotta poo. Serena <laughs> taught us that. Okay, you gotta go. <laughs> you gotta go. Sorry, Serena. You know, I always got my receipts. You know, like I shade equally. But anyway, oh what really Are we to the me final yet? That, wait, wait, wait. Just wait. Twice I saw that whenever Nadal thought that he was losing, he was calling out the trainer. Oh dear. And against Andy Murray, I think he did that with um, who did he play in the quarterfinals? Um, which match was it that he called out the trainer and then sent him away? <laughs> Andy Murray, Andy Murray, he called the trainer. That was another match where he did that as well, but he called the trainer in some situation. In, but he in did Andy it, Murray he match, did it in the Milos match. No, no, that, you're talking about you're talking about Rafa. Yeah. Yeah. But there was some issue that he did that earlier. I think where he mm. was in problems earlier in the, the tournament. But in particular in the um, Andy Murray match, he called for the trainer. First of all, when Andy Murray was about to serve, he said something was in his eye. Oh, I yeah. give him the benefit of the doubt, though I was side eyeing that shit all the way through. It was because dirt. Because there's nothing in the It was dirt, and then what does he proceed to do as soon as he washed it up? Scratch his eye with his dirty hands, <laughs> which is picking your ass all the while and picking up <laughs> dirty balls off the ground. But you know what? I give you the benefit of the doubt. I ain't saying nothing. Then you call out the trainer. Nobody knows for why. People were saying, oh, for the eye. Ain't nothing wrong with the eye because he broke Andy soon afterwards, so you could see the ball clearly. <laughs> then the trainer was about to come out. Then he tell the umpire to Andy. It was the first opening of the set. It was the opening of the third set. Andy Murray sat down thinking it was gonna be. He had to wait for the medical timeout. Rafa then got the umpire and said like, No, 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 I don't need it anymore. And Andy Murray was like, What? And we gotta train. And it's gonna be a break now. He's just like, yeah. No. No. I don't need it Meanwhile, security, security. So they're communicating to the. To the, to the uh, <laughs> there's only about one match going on, right? Because all the match are played on that tur on that turn. So the trainer ain't nowhere else across the ground. The trainer is right there. Security tell the trainer he can't go out on the court because he, the trainer is like, what do you mean I can't go out on the court? Like I need to come out on the court. He's like, no, you can't come out on the court because you know, this is how it is. And Nadal didn't need the trainer for the rest of the tournament. Didn't need the trainer. And to me, that's a little shady and suspect. Just that ain't bit. cute. Hey, whatever. It ain't cute. It's not right, and it's fu I mean, like everyone's gonna be like, it's within the rules because it worked for your fave. I get that, but when your fave is on the receiving end, I know Rafa's gonna be the first one to talk about this. I know he would be. Are we to the final so, yet? <laughs> anyway, to the finals. To the finals. I watched a lot of tennis this week, apparently. Apparently, and anyway. I didn't. So, ladies. The final was great. I know, Andre. The final was great. Before we get to the singles final, do you want to discuss the doubles final? Because it was good too. And I know that was your. Well, let me just say, I ain't got nothing else to say. That my man is keep winning. Okay. Ebert is heavenly. He's winning. That's all I'm gonna say. Third okay. master series final, three thousand points, money. Just saying. But I know, I know for a fact when they pick them for the Davis Cup, those motherfuckers are gonna choke like a. <laughs> they're gonna choke like a chicken. But anyway, final right ladies. It was nice to hear I Jamie Murray advocate for them to get on the doubles team. Oh, it's, it's he who said it. It was Hello? Jamie. Yeah, Jamie said. Um, oh, it was he who said it. Oh, I thought it was Mo. No, 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 no. It was Jamie during his um during the the trophy presentation. He said, "I know that Yannick Noah is listening."
are probably watching, and these two deserve to be on the Davis Cup team. Oh, nice, nice. And I was like, probably these Murray see. brothers, they they like to uh, they like to speak up, and I like it. Their mommy taught them well. <laughs> So yeah, that was nice. So you know, doubles, whatever. the The real final. <laughs> the real final. Oh the man. Don't it was. Say that. Andrew. So Andre. Did you see it from the beginning? I did actually. You know what's so? What I did. I actually rolled up out of bed. I didn't even set an alarm. I was like, ah, whatever. If when it comes on, it's gonna be on two seventeen. I'll just rewind it. But I didn't need to. It started and um and I was ready for it. Fucking six o'clock in the morning though. Well, and I watched. You. I know, I watched, the, I know, right? I'm tired now, but I watched it's the whole damn thing. And six I o'clock? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 6 a.m. I enjoyed the whole thing. I even thought the it final was, set? <laughs> you know what, even the final set, because, you know why? Because, um, but not Dal does, right? You know, the final set is not about tennis. At that point no, in time, the other it's all about heart. person, it, it, it's, yeah. it's, it's all about the fact that you've survived. You've cut this person's leg out from under them, and so now... <laughs> But it hit freely, and everybody. And there goes Andrine. So yeah, <laughs> um, everybody kind of <laughs> thought that Mohan oh, was that's gonna. Like, I'm not oh, playing somebody else in the third set. I've already broken this person. Their body is done, and they have sort of disengaged at this well, point. Not real. his spirit. His Gail's spirit was body, broken. He was pretending that his body looked I'm, done. Third point in, first set. Maybe not the third. Excuse I'm making me? that part up. Gail was looking like his body was done in the first set. <laughs> Actually, I thought Gail played Did really I? smart tennis. I, in the, insofar as to say, it, by saying that, Gail realized that I cannot stand out here and try to out hit Nadal on every single point. I cannot give him the same set of pace. I have to make him generate pace, which was one of the things I noticed about this quote yeah. this week, that you couldn't hit through it. You had to generate your own set of pace. You, the ball wasn't gonna fly off of you, whatever the case would be. So he he mixed up the shots, which I thought was really good. I and kinda I got kinda, tired of seeing like moon balls, but they were working. Right, and because it, it gave Nadal something to to think about, because Nadal couldn't always freely swing on every shot, you know. And Gal was a competent and experienced player. He wasn't some newbie like a Rayonich, you know, or a Dimitrov. Gal can play. He can really play tennis, you know, and he knows his way around the court and willing to do a lot of, you know, experimental things as well. So he can change up his game. He can comfortable come to net, you know, so and Gal can do some crazy shit too. So you I know, think it, it was Nadal, it was good tennis. It was good. It was it really was good. It was good tennis. It was good competitive tennis, and it was nice to see because we haven't seen a good competitive final in a while, regardless who's been there. You know, you think this person might challenge Novak, and then it just doesn't happen. That was just good tennis, and at the end of the day, really, it was all about how long can Gael hold up this level. And come that third set, he just he didn't have anything left. And I think it was a lesson to be learned, and I think he will build on that. And he has obviously thus far had an amazing 2016. And people better watch out because he's here to play, and he is here to win. And he looks good. And it was competitive, and he was right there the whole time until... You know, of course, the end. And the crowd well, was in it, and were, the energy, too. Yeah, because there were many moments where there were traditional moments when this is like a gal disappear moment. Right. And he, and he never did go away. When he, when he got broken in the first set, he broke back. And yep. the only time he didn't break back was when um, Rafa broke for the match. I mean, for yep. the set. So, you know what I mean? Yep. So it was, and it was the same thing. In I mean, in the second set, there were so many opportunities where you could have just said, Gail could just go away and lose 6-2. And he never you did. Saw my, you so saw good. my tweet, right? I was just like, say, Penny, me lock up for a set. You know, I'm just like, guy, all I want is no bagel, no breadstick, no tea. It was when so good. Cool it days. was just his it was fight back. His pure fight back entertainment. Was so fun. It was pure entertainment. I don't entertainment. think Highlight Ray would do this match justice. I think you have to watch every single point for the first two sets. You did. Third set. You could miss that shit. Miss it. <laughs> well, and you know the thing is, I think, I think, um, I think there's a because now Gail is playing attention, 
Um, and because he finally, I think the thing that's really interesting is that Gail is finally admitting that he wants to win by big titles. I mean, sometimes it's so amazing to have an athlete acknowledge the thing they want because every one of us struggle with that. To say, I want this thing that is um, potentially out of reach for you, so you know, you never try, so you never have to say you failed, right? But Gail actually said in his presser that he wants to win big titles. I mean, I just felt really proud to hear that as a fan because I felt like that was something he was always shy of You're saying. You're a fan of guy. I don't even lie on a podcast. I am a fan of guy, right? <laughs> You're a, a fanatic. Fan. You're a dick. I'm a girl for, oh, I love him. Feast, the I'm, I'm, juice. A, I'm addicted to the juice. I mean, I, you know what? It's true. Like, I loved him when he was losing and being careless and crazy. I can't imagine that I won't enjoy him. Now that he's sort of really, really key. Winning. And, and also because, you know what? I think he's realized the same thing we all realize at some point in time. You're not going to do this forever. Right. Um, and Your so body cannot sustain you can't. That shit. And that was what was interesting is like I, I'm hoping that he learns the lesson that he's got to pick his spots for when he can be more aggressive. There were so many short balls in these. Oh rallies my god! With Rafa. And I'm like, what are you so doing? So many. Put that shit away. But you see, yes. but you know what? The, the problem is that I hear all of that, but the, when watching the match, I was just like, I und. The points were long, and I think Murphy's needed to be efficient. I agree yes. with all of that. There were some, Murphy, there were some points where he efficiency would have paid off for him. Like he would, right. you know, he attacks the second ball when the first one was shorter. You know what I mean? And then it's like, it's like, no, honey, you don't. Have, I mean, yes, when he broke Rafa a few times, it was mm -hmm. after a very long rally. So you're right. Strategically, you, it worked for him. But the, the thing about it, you know, I have to say what the good things I'm gonna say about. David Alice, that's like, I don't want to say he's back because I don't think he ever left and went anywhere. Yeah. But I would say that, you know, like, he was able to get into his groove. The, the, yeah. The, it's the, been a while since the, we've the, seen the, that. Uh, exactly. And they say in a 250, okay? This is like, what, four times more than a 250 last time he won a title, okay? Yeah. It's been over a year since he won a title. And he didn't have that pending doom of Nole in the finals uh, close by. Because I'm telling you, had Nola been in the final, Nola would have handled leave it out. Because you, that's what he be, does. He handles everybody. Nadal was able, Andy Murray, I think, and um, what Andy Murray was doing in the semifinal was that he was cutting the points short. Yeah. Stop fucking around. I got no time. To stop playing around with these rallies. And when the rallies were in the nine, when they were getting longer, Andy picked his spot in the first set. Then yeah. he stopped picking his spot. Then he started getting into the rail. Let's go back and forth. Let's go back and forth. And that's not going to work. Yeah. Because I think this yeah. is what happened with Morphe's in the finals as well. Is yeah. that, first of all, Diva Dow was hitting a heavy ball. And every ball was being heavy. It's either a heavy ball or a drop shot for Diva Dow. There was no in-between range. Um, and he was he was ready for this fight. The Dow looked ready. And this is something I, unlike I've seen him seen it for a while. He looked, his faith, focus, and determination, he wanted it. And if he had to claw over everybody's body in there, and so thank God Federer was not one of those caucuses that he, you know, <laughs> body that he pulled I out. Know. Thank God for small miracles, you know. Uh, but you know, also, he you ready. know, he knew, he knew, he knew, he knew that he could, he knew he could go up against Gal. You right. know, yes, can, see, no, I think he no, was surprised. I think he knew he could not last him. If Gal had exactly. to do it, you had God had to do it in two sets. Two sets, yeah. If he That's tried to do it in three sets, because this is what this is what when and the same thing I noticed with the bathroom break with Murray when he came out, the dad was just like, you know what? I'm gonna change my strategy. I'm just gonna extend the rallies. Wear you down. All D Vidal is back on court. I'm wearing opponents down. And if this is because I think he tried to do be be more efficient because of his body. Issues for the past year and a half is probably perhaps why he's not winning. And plus, you cannot outlast Joker, right? Joker yeah. will wear you down too. So Joker's stake in the Dal game. I think you mentioned it, Andre, is that Joker's game is in response to Diva Dal game, where I'm wearing you down with long points, whatever. But I mean, but it was a good finals for two. I'm sorry. What were you, you asked about well, why? I, I, I want to know why Boris doesn't think it's weird that Novak doesn't get tired. <laughs> I'll tell you what Boris said. Boris says, I know him. I'm around him all the time. 
and I know he ain't doing anything, you know, like, and he's clean, oh. and how did Andy Murray suggest that, actually, Andy Murray didn't suggest that Nola was treated, Andy Murray didn't no, suggest he did anyone, no, he, didn't. he just he said just that in said. the past, he felt that, you know, I've, I've had this feeling and suspicion that perhaps this person across the net may have been doping because they're not getting because tired. Because they don't get tired. <laughs> I don't know why Boris is Well, you know what I like Andy about... Murray. But what I like about Boris is that Andy Murray simp- Andy Murray said no names. Not and a then, name. And then, not no, a name. And then, not a name. And then Boris Becker proceeds to, to to mention that there were rumors about Nadal, which I was like, okay, Boris, who told you to start talking? <laughs> but in second, yeah, I mean, like, he then... He says, Nadal is clean. Better is clean. No, 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 no. is clean. Andy no. Murray is clean. No, but the thing is, First he says all the top guys are clean, just like you said, right? And then he <laughs> says, and of course there are rumors about. I was like, what? <laughs> Why exactly. are you spreading the rumor though? So I quit. Murray by naming names. Hey, Boris. That was interesting. You need to shut up, Boris, because you yourself was suspicious. Or, I mean, we've all seen it on um, social media that people found evidence of Boris's own questions about people in his era, and he was the Andy Murray of his era, wondering aloud <laughs> who, who, who he might be playing who never oh gets fired. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know what? I quit. I quit. But all, all I have to say is I, I feel somewhat gratified that my favorites get very tired. Hey, <laughs> Sometimes they no get bagels doubt. in the final. And they Federer, get bagels in the Federer final. gets soft. <laughs> Federer, he, was, he, Federer soft say he got tired. He said that, didn't he? Honey, he, he was, was tired like, in the he was tired in the Olympic final. No, so, I mean this tournament right yeah, here though. He yeah, said he was like, body, you know what? I got yeah. tired. He's like, I'm not used to this. You're not used to it yet. Your body falls out of it. You know, it's like hey. going to the gym. <laughs> so I'm no just saying. Like, <laughs> Nole never oh, gets tired. No, well, I, I don't know who Andy was talking about, but apparently Andy and Nole are going to have to go to fisticuffs about it because Boris decided to open Yeah, her mouth. I don't hey. know. Boris, look, look, girl. I think it's time, you know, like, if you're manning in the tournament, shut the fuck up. <laughs> no, you know, pretty much. Up. You yeah. can't talk, okay? <laughs> Go eat some spinach something, I don't know, some kale salad or something. I don't know what the hell is serving at Joker's place. Oh Go have God. yourself a, a bite, a, a, a rabbit sandwich, okay? Can we ask that question, though? Can we ask the question of... Um, Who's does, cooking at so, the vegan place? No. So <laughs> what does this mean for Rafa? Because I really don't think it means much. I mean, I think what it means is that he might last the second week of Roland Garros. But I still oh, saw problems in his game. Yeah, sure, and I no, I I, th- I think that um, Rafa's a confidence player, and I think this will do him well. I don't know how far it's going to carry him, but I think it'll do him well. Actually, well, I'm not I, so much so concerned about Rafa. I'm just concerned about the response from the rest of the tour, because what yeah, I saw they're going to get intimidated the, by him again. If, exactly, because yeah. uh, I mean, like Dominic team played well enough to beat Rafa, at least troubled him, take a set at least and bother him tremendously. Andy Murray had something working for him there and whatever the case may be. Uh, Monfils made you know, the wrong era, a little bit of faulty tactitude, that's my favorite Rafa word. Um, and he could have gotten that match into straight sets, but you know, didn't. So whether players are going to be like, if I want to beat Rafa, I have to be efficient, I have to be on point from the beginning. But it also requires a certain level of focus, and I don't know how many men out there can really do that, right? With, that with can, all their hormones, yeah, that's exactly, true. Exactly, <laughs> to zone in, you know, and not get distracted. So yeah, I mean, I'm really they, they do get they get hormonal when they pay Rafa. They get very like... amped, they get angsty, they get like anxious. So yeah, um, yeah I mean, it's that it's Let that hundred percent. That's a part of the thing that goes with playing the king of clay. Yeah. And also, I just have a word for these Spanish boys out there, okay? Okay. Ain't no fucking way I want to see any of you mofos show up against Rafa in any tournament, Barcelona, um, Rome, or Madrid, and getting fucking bagel and breadstick. I will not have it. I will be writing a letter to <laughs> Chris Commode and be like, look, any Divadal and another Spanish player coming together, that match is diva da by default. We ain't got time for that shit. Put on an EXO in the in that event. Nobody got time for that shit because. Well, all I, I gotta say the... is that Rafa's going after his Barcelona crown. Next Get week it. he's gonna go snatch it back from K. So hey, do what you gotta do. 
Okay, <laughs> okay, we will we'll see you. You know, but you know, I have to say congratulations to you, Andrine. You know, and congratulations to, you know, um, Shane. You know, your man brought give you some real <laughs> stuff and stuff this week. Your man D Vidal won the title, and it was a good title win. And the crowd got their money worth and their energy. Totally, three hours um, practically transferred almost. over to um, TV audiences because. Um, Quiet and is kept. I was watching some of those crowd people, and they own people there. People on the show for federal matches. Yeah, and no, federal you know what <laughs> we're, we're not going to talk about that. It's a biased when we talk about that. I will say that, though. It's true. Every, every single federal match was packed. The others, not so much. Not so much. I mean, come I on, people. Enjoy. Go for the other Go to see other players. And too. even though we were in technically we were in France geographic area, per se. Sangha had no love. Nobody <laughs> showed up for Sangha's matches. I, I was surprised. I mean, I have to say that's part of the reason why Sangha played Federer so well. That was the first time he actually had a crowd. And you know who Sangha comes alive with a crowd? <laughs> I'm trying to prove a point because he went away so many to to um Mumphies in the next time. But you know what? I'm happy because you know what? No, Mumphies totally broke down Sangha's strokes. Sangha By the time Mumphies was done, Sangha had no forehand. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, congratulations <laughs> to all the players. We're happy. Um, so next week we have Barcelona and the ladies are uh, in Stuttgart, and it's without Maria yeah. this time around. So, Angie won the car last game. year. So, Angie's looking weak. So, I expect someone else to drive away with that Mercedes Benz <laughs> or Porsche. Uh, Porsche. 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 Sorry, I the Porsche. Best. Porsche. It's Porsche. Sorry. Mm-hmm. My bad, people. Shoot, God. You know, and. Istanbul, I think. Ladies. Istanbul. Yeah, there are actually quite a few tournaments coming up next I think week. I over there, you know, and I did look at the draw. But I will tell you something. There might be a lot of tournaments next week, but I don't know if I'm going to catch all of them. Cause I'm I, not going to catch shit. I'm tired. Uh, <laughs> I'm probably going to try <laughs> to catch the end. The end, of, <laughs> the end of Barcelona. But yeah, they have Bucharest and they have Istanbul. Yeah. So, we, so we've got Barcelona for, on the ATP side and Bucharest on the ATP side. And then we've got Stuttgart and Istanbul on the women's side. All right. Yeah. So right, let's fans, hope something thank you very fun. Much. And again, thanks to Kamal Murray for being on our podcast. We really enjoy his um, contribution to our podcast. We're happy to have him. And thanks, Andrine, for working your connects to get him here. We appreciate it. I'm sure our fans will too. And fans, don't forget you we're on iTunes, we're on YouTube, we're on Podbean, and we're also on Twitter. So don't forget to tweet wow, us. We're everywhere. We're everywhere. everywhere. We're on Facebook too. Yes. Because, you know, we bring it to you real and controversial, you know. <laughs> but, you know, thanks again. Good night, good day. And retweet us, you know, and comment below, okay? Even if it's hateration, we respond to all comments. But if you're trying to come for us, come for us, correct, okay? Don't come with, with receipts. Us. With receipts, okay? Yeah, with receipts, receipts, motherfuckers. Ciao. <laughs> Ciao. Good night, good night.